Hi, you all. Welcome back. I'm glad you're joining me. And we're continuing to talk about how to hear God well in your prayer. And where we, I'll say, left off last time, I was talking about the non traditional ways that God speaks to us. And, um, you know, through dreams, through prophecy, and, and the such. And I'm going to continue talking about, in that regard, um, similarly, with numbers. Numbers are something that God speaks to me many times. And again, I, I, at the beginning here, I just, in case you're cutting in right here at the very end of this uh you know, teaching on hearing God, I regularly reinforce the fact that we don't go to these um, outward manifestations that, you know, have the ability to be modified and influenced by the God of this air, who is Satan. He actually has control over the things of this world, uh, according to how people give him, um, you know, ear to his lies, right? Of course. I mean, he doesn't, he's not out roaming around creating mayhem uh, without any um, being, any people being submissive to his will and his ways. And that's, I don't want to take, I don't want to go down that bunny trail. But the point is, is that we don't look to the things of this world that are subject to change. They are not the word of God. And the word of God is our foundation for understanding God and hearing from him. And whenever we start leaning on outward sensory information, I'll call it, dreams, prophecies, numbers, just that of that sort. Um, it's not always reliable. It could just be a pizza dream, okay? <laughs> it could be something that's just coming from your soul and not coming from the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to, again reinforce that before we mention some of these uh, points that are mentioned in the scriptures. I mean, God does talk to us in numbers. As it says here, let me show you here, in Psalms 90 verse 12, it says, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And I know that I know that people out there say, well, that just means, you know, use your time wisely so that it's benefiting the kingdom. And I totally believe that. I think that's probably, you know, 99% the meaning of that verse. You, It's really talking about apply yourself toward the things of the kingdom and, and redeem the time, right, for the the time of our redemption draws nigh. But you literally can take that as literally you can see your days counted. You can see things uh, numerically um, impressed upon you that are spiritually significant. And God did show us these things in the scriptures. I'm not, I'm definitely not going to go through each and every one, but um, one here in 2 Kings 20, King Hezekiah was promised to, to be healed and he asked for a sign to encourage his faith. And, and he said, if he would just make the sun go back on the sundial, in other words, change the time. And then he would know that he knew that God would heal him and God granted his request. So that, and again, that's, we don't, we really don't look, we, again, I mentioned this on the last teaching, we don't look for the signs, but God can bring them across our path and they're highlighted to us 
and just impressed upon our heart to confirm the word that's already, that God's already spoken to our heart, right? But when you're out there looking for the sign first, Jesus called that an adulterous generation. You know, we aren't looking for signs to get direction. We aren't getting, you know, looking for the supernatural to get a quote unquote word from God. No, we look to the word first. And that's what will establish our hearts, establish our faith. And then you could say the icing on the cake or just a God wink is when we see maybe numbers or have a dream or a uh, you know prophecy, just these things that are the bells and whistles of the spirit that can encourage your heart even more so in the faith that you possess by hearing the word. As it says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So that's how you establish your faith. And then these other, I'll call them tools of the spirit, just can come along and God is just so gracious. He can encourage us multiple ways in the faith, but we don't go seeking after those things first most, right? And here's another example. <laughs> this is not a scripture I normally go to, but it's something, I suppose, I mean, it's a whole book in the New Testament that many times we just overlook, and that's, that's sad, because we are in the last days, and we really do need to grasp what's being said here in the book of Revelation. And it says here in chapter 12, verse 13, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So what that's talking about, by the way, is it's talking about how uh, Satan came and persecuted Israel uh, because Jesus was an Israelite, right? And the Israel nation is typified as a woman in this verse. And Israel gave birth, so to say, to the male child or Jesus, right? So that's how you would understand that verse. Verse 14 says, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. And that's so profound. I'm just not going to even uh, mention anything right now because we're talking about something else. That she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for, a get this, a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Wow. You know, this is really profound, and I'm not going to open a can of worms <laughs> here talking about end times, but it says right there um, what's going to happen to Israel during the time of the tribulation, right? Because literally, this is a big eye-opener if we would just receive that God talks to us in numbers, Literally, a time and times and half a time is literally three and a half years. So for the great tribulation, the three and a half years that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, um, Israel will be preserved. So that's pretty profound. That's numbers. And uh, another, uh, another example is, you know, when uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, Pharaoh, when Joseph was in Egypt in bondage, in, as you remember, maybe in Genesis 41, the Pharaoh had a dream about cows, seven cows, well, actually 14 cows. And the cows, the number seven, was definitely representative as it proved out in history that the seven represented seven years of fatness and seven years of famine. So 
there's some numbers for you. And then also another example is in Revelation 21.16, the New Jerusalem, where we will all live, all us Christians will live. Um, the New Jerusalem that comes down from heaven is described in great detail and it says it's such and such uh, cubits long and such and such cubits high and de you know deep. It's all um, a cube, essentially. It's, it's a square, right? And that's, fifth, in case you're interested, it converts to approximately, um, people believe that a cubit is about 18 inches from your elbow to your finger. And so that would make the New Jerusalem, if you want to start envisioning that new city that we will all live in one day, um, it's 1,500 miles high by 1,500 miles long and 1,500 miles wide. That's a big city. <laughs> so, so there's some more numbers for you. And I'm, you know, speaking Revelation, here in Revelation 13, 18, uh, many times we skip this part, but God inspired John the writer to say, here is wisdom. So, you know, numbers are not a fickle thing. It says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And even, you know, the grocery grocery clerk people, they can, you know, I mean, the world knows this number. You know, you don't have to try and convince Christians or anybody. You know, they all, you know, rattle that number off. You know, they think they're being funny and clever saying that and but you know that verse literally says here is wisdom so you know we shouldn't just uh belittle numbers they're significant for sure uh here's another example so here in second peter 3 verse 7 and 8 you know speaking of which we're kind of on this uh theme of end times apparently it says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire unto, until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. Isn't that interesting how it's put? Do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Okay, so in context, he's talking about the end times or the judgment when he returns, the wrath of God. And he literally says, don't forget this. And he's talking about dates and times. And if you think about it, Let's count up the days and the times here. So we are, if you go and look at the biblical history, we literally have just completed approximately the 6,000th year. If you take the Bible literally, like I do, like I hope you do, you know, the earth and everything in it was created in six literal days. I believe the word. And so if you follow along through all the historical references of lineage and whatnot in that regard, we come to the understanding that we are, just as we know, you know, we are in 2021 AD now. So that means, um, you know, Jesus came approximately 2,000 years after Abraham and Abraham lived approximately 2,000 years after creation. So we are literally into, you, you could say, according to that verse, the seventh day. And as the reference goes, it's, it mentions creation. 
Don't be ignorant of what was revealed in Genesis. Um, what did God do on the seventh day? The se you could say the seventh you know, the beginning of the se seventh millennia. You know, that's what the day we're in, living in as as of right now. And he rested, right? God rested on the seventh day. So the type and shadow there is really exciting. So you can say, when man, when you really dig in and, you know, look at these numbers, they can be really, you know, revelatory and and give you understanding about, for instance, in this situation, last days, eschatology, you know, end times understanding. And it's exciting, you know, it stirs up your faith to know these things. And again, a similar type of example in Hosea, if you go there in chapter six, just as I was saying here in verse two, it says, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Okay, so here's times. We're, we're seeing even in the scriptures that God is revealing times to us, numbers. And it's not by accident. And what... You know, of course, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, and it says right there, similarly, that he will raise us up in the third day also. So we were just in Second Peter 3, and it said, Beloved, don't forget this one thing, that one day is as a thousand years. So... Jesus, it's been 2,000 years, or you could say it's been two days, so to say, since Jesus rose from the dead, right? We're in 2021 now. So that's, you know, 1,000 years is as one day. So we are now into the third day. We're, into, we're working into the third millennia here, the third day. And what's it say right there? It says the third day he will raise us up. Wow. That we would live in his sight. So this is, I don't know about you, but I think this is exciting to know that God is, as Jesus said, coming back soon. Jesus is appearing soon. We will be raised up with him on the third day. So get ready. Be ready. <laughs> you know what I mean by that. Just stay expectant and excited, right? Anticipating you uh, being totally transformed and raised up to live with him forever, right? And Jesus, look at this. This is an interesting type and shadow in John chapter 2. Let's go there. Look at this. Chapter 2 of John, no less. This is the first verse and, for that matter, the first miracle that Jesus performed in the book of John. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but if you do, it's all about, of course, when Jesus turned the water into wine and there's so much symbolism in this story, but it's staying in this context of, you know, teaching how God, how to hear God better, you know, that little third day there isn't there just by, um, it's not, uh, you know, by accident, you know, God could, Jesus could have done or went to the wedding on the 15th day, you know, I mean, no, it was on the third day that he went to the wedding. And we know, with all, in, in context with all these similar verses, that we will be raised up with him in the third day. And what happens when we are raised up on the third day with him? We go to the wedding feast, right? There's a wedding feast in the book of Revelation. I think it's, let's see, what is it? Chapter 19. 
if you want to look it up. So that wedding feast is typified in this first miracle that Jesus performed. And it was all on the third day. So interesting, huh? So so you can see, you know, me mentioning these things is that seeing numbers is really exciting. It can stir up your faith and get your your focus on Jesus and 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 you know, it's like I said, it's like dessert. You know, it's 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 fun. It's in, it 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 stirs up your faith to want to dig in some more and find some more nuggets that God has hidden for you to discover in the word, right? So, so um you know, mentioning some uh, you know, switching gears here to that, well, switching gears. I want to mention that, of course, it's always through Jesus that he speaks to us, right? He is the mediator between us and God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And you could say, no one speaks to us but him, right? We don't listen to strangers' voices. And that's exactly as it says here in Hebrews. Here in Hebrews 1, verse 1, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So the point is, is that we hear from God through his son. We wouldn't even be able to hear God if it weren't through Jesus. If we didn't have that perfect mediator between us and God, right? And Jesus said that many times. He said, if you would just pray to the Father in my name, right? So when we're in prayer, when we're hearing from God, it's all through his son, Jesus. And I wanted to definitely emphasize that in this entire teaching to make sure that is absolutely clear. There's no other name by whom we have access to our heavenly Father, And that goes for hearing from him, too, because there's lots of false gods out there saying, oh, well, I can hear from, you know, Allah or Buddha or, you know, Hare Krishna or, you know, just I'm not familiar with all the other. I hate saying that word other. There are no other religions. Christianity is the only true way to God, the true God, the only living God. So sorry to be so, I'm not, well, I shouldn't say that. I am not sorry to be so adamant. That is the truth. And I, for me to say anything other than that, I would be misleading people. (laughs) That's for me to say there's other ways to God besides Jesus. Well, that's a lie. Just plainly put, right? So we want to make sure that if you want to have a, absolutely, if you want to have a relationship with your heavenly father who loves you so much, even if you don't know him, he loves you so much. The way to hear from him is through his son, Jesus only. So we, I definitely want to mention that. And again, if if you go to 1 Timothy 2, here in verse 5, it says, For there is, no, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So that's what I was just talking about. He is the one mediator that we have access to, to bring us to relationship with, intimate relationship with our heavenly father with god our our mediator is not you know 
you know, beads on, um, you know, some people pray beads or they pray to a statue. No, it's through Jesus Christ that we can have this relationship and hear from God, hear of all the wonderful things he has planned for us, right? So trust in him if you haven't today. He's the only one that's been resurrected from the dead and thus he has proven his divinity because there's no other quote-unquote prophet that has ever risen from the dead except Jesus. All other types are false gods, false prophets. Jesus, in a nutshell, is the real deal. <laughs> so I just want to mention, just mention that little point there. So uh, some other concluding points that are so important to make is that Again, I want to just bring it full circle and remind everybody that God is not withholding wisdom from us. He wants us to know him. Eternal life, as Jesus said in John 17, is knowing the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, and intimate knowledge. And that comes by prayer, right? I mean, how can you intimately know someone if you don't communicate with them? So the point is, is he's not withholding wisdom or understanding from us at all. And I wanted to reinforce that before we conclude this teaching for now, right? Here in James, it says, and here in verse 5, James 1, 5, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him and he will gladly tell you. For he is always ready to give a bountiful supply of wisdom to all who ask him. He will not resent it. Isn't that wonderful? It's just, he wants you to know him. And he, he will grant you wisdom and understanding bountifully without any condemnation or judgment. He wants you to know that you know that you heard him, right? And similarly, in Matthew 13, it says the same thing. So Jesus said here in verse 11, he replied to them, this is the Amplified Bible, to you, to you, it's been given to know the secrets and mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has spiritual knowledge to him will more be given, and he will be furnished richly so that he will have an abundance. But to him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So this, I mean, it's not identical to what I just mentioned, but the point is, is that God wants you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And you may, you know, I don't want to just overlook the point there that Jesus said also that to others there in his audience weren't receiving wisdom. You know, he said they would, hasn't been given, you know, and he was speaking of the Pharisees. The reason why it hadn't been given to them to understand is because they first hadn't even received Jesus. So, it, you know, goes Jesus, God talks to us line upon line. And if we're not willing to first receive step one, then he can't talk to you to step th two. You know, it's like asking a baby who can't crawl, oh, well, go run around the block. Yeah, I mean, you got to you gotta grow in steps. And the Pharisees who wouldn't even receive Jesus as their Messiah, as their Savior, like the disciples had, well, they couldn't receive the wisdom nuggets that Jesus was very willing to give to them, to reveal to them, but they were unwilling to receive it. They were very prideful, which leads me to my next point. You know, th these are really essential points to remember when we're, when we are wanting to hear from God is knowing 
that he gives wisdom generously, that he wants us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. He is not withholding at all. He has come to reveal himself completely to us. We are children of the light, not in the darkness. And so we should expect to, you know, not think, oh, well, God's just so mysterious. You know, no, he wants you. It says you have the mind of Christ. Does that sound like you're confused? No, Christ isn't confused, right? Well, you have the mind of Christ. In the spirit realm, you have the mind of Christ. So we don't want to lean on our soulish understanding. If you are experiencing confusion or challenge understanding God, acknowledge the truth. Don't say, well, but, but, I don't know. Be careful what you are confessing over yourself. If you're confessing not the truth, well, you're essentially cursing yourself. You know, you your words have great power. You are a kingly priest, whether you know it or not. And when you say those kinds of things over yourself, you are empowering you to remain deceived and in the dark, so to say. You know, but you're not in the dark. You have been given the the ability to understand all the mysteries of God. You have the mind of Christ. So remember that when you are praying and looking for understanding is acknowledge what the truth says. Acknowledge and trust that God, you said you would give me an abundance of wisdom. So I'm not going to have any but, 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 God, I don't know. I'm always confused. You know, don't say those things. Don't, don't negate your prayers for wisdom with those types of complaints that aren't of faith. You know, when we complain and gripe and <laughs> it's not faith. That's not faith, right? <laughs> Complaining. I, you know, if any of you know Charles Caps, he's gone to be with the Lord. But there's a, one of his stories is he was griping and complaining. I hope I get this right. But it goes along the lines of, you know, his story. He was just talking to God about his problems and going on and on and on. And, and God interrupted him. He said, he said, Charles. And Charles said, what? You know, he's like kind of caught off guard. Charles, what are you doing? God said. And Charles said, well, I'm praying to you. I'm praying to you, God. And God said, you're not praying. You're complaining. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a, that is God. I mean, obviously that's God. And just the fact that I would remember that story. That's God too. <laughs> So just be aware when you are praying, pray in faith. And after, quote unquote, after praying, as you go about your day, don't curse and overturn your prayers with complaining. You know, stand fast in your faith and say, God, you heard my prayers. I believe that that you are granting me Wisdom that is supernaturally by the Spirit. I might not know these things in the natural, but I'm going to know these things quickly. Know them, you know, just quick by the Spirit. And you'll see, you will. You'll just, things will come to your awareness and you'll be like, man, I know. I didn't think that. That's a God. That's a God thought. You know, like this story I just told you. I wasn't thinking of telling you that, but God reminded me to share that with you. So, so it's just, you know, things to be aware of. And speaking of which, talking about the Pharisees who were in the dark, let's go to James one twenty one. So here it says, let's go to New King James. It says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Okay, so this brings me to my next 
pertinent point to remind you all about is, you know, people many times don't let the Bible get in the way of their beliefs, like the Pharisees. Pharisees like, ah, that's just Jesus. Isn't his father a carpenter? Who wants to listen to him? You know, they were, oof, man, they were, their nose was up in the air so far that, I mean, they got all the rain. <laughs> it just flooded them, you know? Um, so you don't want to be prideful. You want to receive with meekness the implanted word, right? Which is able to save your souls. It's for, it's for your salvation. You know, it's for, it may be a correct, word for discipline you know we learn we are disciplined by the word that's how God teaches us so if we're you know full of pride and well I got it figured out God I've been saved 30 years I know that verse by heart you know but maybe you're not practicing it if you're not practicing the word that doesn't mean that means you don't know it (laughs) <laughs> you know, you might you might be able to quote it, but are you really, is it become so real to your heart that you're actually effortlessly, and I mean that, effortlessly, it's become part of your nature. As it says right there, receive with meekness the word that is able to save your soul. So you've got to be meek. You know, Jesus is really low. He came as a humble servant. And so when we say, well, I know all this. That's okay, God. I got to figure it out. You know, well, you'll all you'll hear are crickets. <laughs> and when I say that, I'm talking about you. It will be silent on the other end of the phone line talking to God. When you say, oh, I know everything. Oh, I'm sure you won't say that. But if you're your disposition, if your frame of mind is that way, well, yeah, I've done that. Because I've heard people, you know, they come, they approach and they ask for wisdom. I'm just saying generally speaking. I'm not saying anybody in particular. But the ones I've noticed that folks have the hardest problem hearing from God is they say, oh, yeah, but I know that. Yeah, I know that. I've heard that verse. Yeah, I know that. I know that, yeah. You know, I'll share things with them. Oh, yeah, I know that too. It's an I know it all kind of quote unquote um, personality. So you want to make sure, even if you're 90 years old and you've been saved since you were 10, you know, when you pray to God, He is all knowing God. And he knows you better than you know yourself. You know, you may think you have it all figured out, but he knows what can help you. So whenever we go to God and we're looking for wisdom, you want to have a humble heart act and, and really sincerely, you know, just acknowledge maybe you don't know everything. And be, have open ears, you know, like Dumbo that elephant. If you guys remember that old cartoon, you know? Just be big ears, you know, as, as the Bible says, be s- slow to speak and quick to listen, right? Just don't be the one always talking, too, I should say. Lots of people, they just talk, 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 talk when you pray. And it's like, when, do you, when are you listening to God? He wants to talk back. He wants to answer. He wants to answer you. He doesn't want your prayers to be vain repetitions like we read about earlier, much earlier. You know, so as it says here in First Peter 5, here in chat, or verse 5, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit. Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So humility is huge, 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 huge. If you want to hear clearly from God and not misunderstand him, right? So 
He gives generously, but if you if you go to him with this know-it-all mentality, uh, you'll have a difficult time hearing from him. And and a big and I mentioned this early on, but one thing that makes you dull of hearing is religion, being law-minded. Well, I need to do this. I haven't done that. Being law-minded, as it says in Corinthians, it's like a veil over your the eyes of your heart. You know, as far as understanding God, it hardens your heart. And actually, Jesus said that of the Pharisees in context, as we were just reading. Let me go back there in Matthew 13. Here he was talking, like I said, of, of the Israelites, the religious folks who weren't listening to him. He says in verse 15, For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Isn't that wonderful? To know, again, I love how, in contrast, Jesus reminds us that as long as we have hearing ears to listen you know, just listen and and allow yourself to be counseled by the word. You know, is it speaking to you? If it's if it's rubbing you your fur, so to say, the wrong way, well then, don't disregard that, but acknowledge it and say, "Thank you, Lord. Guess you're showing me something that I needed to really know." You know, don't say, "Well, that's just let's just go find another verse I can cherry pick." <laughs> you know, no, you want to, you want to take all the scriptures, right? We don't just take little pieces, the ones we really like, right? Because if we just pick the one, that's like a child, right? The ch- kids just want the candy, you know, they just want the ice cream. Yeah, forget the green beans. But, you know, kids, they get sick and they really don't grow, right? They don't grow up if that's all they're eating is junk, so we don't eat only the sweet, juicy stuff. But if there is some words of correction, as we read the word, you want to receive it and allow yourself to grow thereby, right? But don't fall like the Pharisees fell and they l- literally missed out on eternal salvation many times when Jesus was preaching to them. Because it says, Jesus said, let me go back there. It says they are hard of hearing, hard of hearing because their eyes, they have closed, right? That's how they grew dull of hearing God. They closed their eyes. They purposely said, oh no, I just can't receive that. That's that's just too hard too hard a word to receive. You mean I have to submit to Jesus to receive salvation? I can't earn it by my own righteousness? No, you can't earn it. You can't ever be good enough to be your own savior, essentially. And that's where the Pharisees fell into the ditch because they were unwilling to submit and receive with meekness the living word, Jesus, their savior, because he didn't come in a package they liked. They liked the priests with the flowing white robes and, you know, would just exalt themselves at the dinner table, like Jesus said. You know, Jesus always took the lowest place and that didn't appeal to their sense of proprietary. I'm saying that wrong, but you know what I'm saying. (laughs) He was not religious in any sense. And that just, it it just rubbed them the wrong way. You know, they thought somebody would come with pomp and circumstance, right? But Jesus came 
as a friend of sinners. And because the Pharisees and scribes were not humble in that way, um, they they turned their hearts and their ears and from listening to him. <clears throat> that when they would come to Jesus, many times it was just to test him. It wasn't to learn from him. It was to trap him and <laughs> supposedly cause Jesus to trip up. But we know that didn't happen, right? So that that is one pertinent point I want you to remember when here you want to hear from God is don't be like the religious Pharisees. Don't be like a know-it-all. You know, come with a humble heart and be teachable. And man, God, you, you, you have big old ears ready to hear and God's willing and wanting to pour out his understanding so that you just grow in leaps and bounds, right? Being able to hear his voice very clear. So there's one other big biggie thing is when we do hear his voice is to act on it. You know, here in the Western culture, uh, we think we know something when we've just heard about it. Oh yeah, I read about that, sure. You know, it's like a mental ascent, a mental awareness, but it hasn't become part of your being. You know, when Jesus would teach his disciples, he said, this is what I want you to do. Listen to my voice. This is my direction. Now go out and do it. You know, he would send the disciples out to heal the sick, for instance. You know, they didn't just stay in the boat and fish some more. You know, <laughs> no, he, he, he showed them and taught them. And then the way they really received that word is they became who they were looking at. You know, we look into the glory of the face of Jesus. We look at his beautiful character and then knowing our similar image, our identity that we have in him, we likewise act on the same word. We walk it out. We, um, quote unquote, we do the word, right? As it says here in James. So here in chapter 2, verse 20, it says, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works, or you could say hearing God in his direction without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his uh, Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? Okay, and we don't normally mention this in context of hearing from God and prayer, but if he gives you a direction or a nudge, an impression, and you don't act on that, you're allowing yourself, your heart to become hardened to hear his voice next time. And so we want to be diligent listeners and diligent listeners actually act, of course, knowing that that is God speaking to you. He's not just saying that to fill some void space with words. <laughs> I mean, he wants you to have direction and to act on it. You know, he's not just saying that because he wants to talk, right? So... When we diligently act on the word, then we will hear the next word and hear the, hear the next word, right? But God isn't going to give us the whole truckload of revelation if we haven't yet been um, applying the first word that we heard from him, right? Um, an ex simple example of this is when, so when you are leading someone to salvation, who doesn't believe in Jesus yet. 
Uh, you're not going to talk to them about uh, sowing and reaping and, you know, the ways of the kingdom if they haven't yet first received Jesus. You know, just the simple word of salvation. Believe on Jesus and become saved and, and become a child of God. And if people are like, no, I, I'm, I'm not ready for that. Well, you don't keep on talking to them about, you know, just the ways of the kingdom and all the other, you know, the heaven that's waiting for. I mean, I suppose you can mention that too. But it says that spiritual things of God are as foolishness to the world. They don't listen to all that other stuff that you're talking about because they haven't yet first come into the kingdom. You got to, you know, Jesus said in John 3 that no one can enter the kingdom without being born again first. So God isn't going to show you other kingdom principles if you're not first willing to obey the word to be born again first. So just as that example of, you know, applies, you can apply that to everything else, walking by faith with God. You know, you do one thing and then he'll show you something else, but he's not going to show you the whole, you know, 90 years of your destiny walk with him all at once. Of course not. You know, your your fuses, your circuit breakers would blow. <laughs> You know, I mean, we're children of God. We can only hand we can only handle one thing at a time. Okay, <laughs> so so that's just encouragement for you all to to walk it out. And, and you know, when He gives you an a, um, impression and direction, to go with that. Just step out. It may be uncomfortable for your flesh. It says the flesh strives against the spirit. So don't be ignorant that, you know, any renewing of your mind that's going on, when you hear that word, your flesh wants to reason it away. Your flesh, you know, when I'm saying your flesh, I'm talking about your reasoning power. The carnal mind wants to say, oh, well, that's that's over the top. No, I don't think that's God. That's, that's not God. That's not right. You know, a lot of times when God talks to you about forgiveness, you know, um, you know, a lot. Usually, the typical fleshly response is, "Well, they're wrong, and I'm right." <laughs> you know, so that's not submitting to the Word. <laughs> when God gives you direction, it says, "You know, that wasn't so polite what you said to them," and you don't say, "Well, they're wrong, God." You know, so that's just an example of walking um, in humility and, and walking and, and stepping out and following even the quote unquote little things, you know, being forgiving and walking in patience and, you know, you're submitting to the spirit and his preference to walk in peace toward all people, Right. So I hope that helps you all. That is a big thing, you know. Walking and, and hearing God clearly is not leaning on your own understanding. That's a huge thing. And, and you know, following those promptings you get. Don't just disregard them with your the big head knowledge, right? Don't fall into that trap. As it says here in James 1 again, it says in James 1, 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So I'm sure none of us want to, us ourselves, deceive ourselves. But that's what happens when we don't act on the word. You know, you, you uh, essentially, you know how a can an old timey candle is made? You may not, but... Um, you know, you dip the, the flax in hot uh, candle wax 
and you know just comes up hard just a little bit and then you dip it down again and re raise it up and okay there's another layer of hard wax and you, as you what that is it's like every time you disregard and disobey and not obey those promptings of God you're hardening your heart even more and more and hardening it again until and each time you're deceiving yourself deceiving yourself deceiving yourself <laughs> and it makes it hard to hear from God when you really need to hear from God then right so it's to your benefit to follow those you know they you think they're small promptings but in God nothing is small in God's eyes so follow those promptings and what you're doing is you're building up your your you're establishing your heart soft and pliable and easily persuaded toward God. So when he gives you that life uh, liberating word of direction that can propel your life astronomically in one moment, you're there. You hear it. You're on time, you know. And that's why it's so important to follow these little promptings and act on them in his, you know, toward the spirit. Act, be be led of the spirit, right? Because it's to it's for your good. It's for your good in the long run, especially when you, we do run into these tough times. And man, you need a word. You need a word from God. But if you've spent a decade of disobeying him it's going to it could be very hard for you to hear him but but god is merciful and he can turn your heart of stone to a heart of flesh like that with with godly repentance you know just being humble as he says humble yourselves beneath the mighty hand of god so he can raise you up so his mercies are new every morning right you don't have to, you know, climb your way back up to God because you've been a moron for a decade. <laughs> you yeah, know, God is gracious, long-suffering, patient toward all his little children all the time, right? So I hope you all benefited from this and and I had such a wonderful time sharing with you and and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or if you can give me any pointers. I always want my um, teachings to come across correctly. You know, I don't want to be misunderstood any way, shape, or form. So if you have any questions about what I've shared, want to comment or pray, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Be happy to talk with you. And by the way... I'm taking the time to remember to share this. Every Monday night, I have an online Bible study where we are getting together and talking about how God has divinely healed us. It's our inheritance, being children of the kingdom, all through Jesus' work, of course. So if you would like to join in that, feel free to uh, reach out to me and I'll give you that information. Okay, you all have a wonderful week and I'll talk to you again next time. Bye bye.